and then coming across someone that is like, no matter what we do, this person's gonna die anyway. And we just have to walk away from them. Hmm. Welcome back to Other People's Lives. I'm Joe Santagato. I'm Greg Dybeck. For anyone out there that would like to be a guest on our show, uh, hit us up. Our email is oplpodcast at gmail.com. Yes, and today we're going to be doing one of our favorite things on this show, which is learning about someone's job, uh, specifically a job I think neither of us would ever be able to do. No. So we're speaking to a woman who reached out uh, with the subject line, 24-year-old paramedic that has seen enough tragedy to last 100 lifetimes. So we're going to learn all about the job, uh, what she goes through on a daily basis, how she copes, and what motivates her to be a first responder. So we've got the guests on the line, and thank you so much for being on today. Thank you so much for having me. Of course. So I, I feel like I always mix up the terms paramedic, EMT, EMS, I, I don't know yeah. like what those things are. So what is your exact title and what is that job description? Um, so I'm a paramedic. Uh, the way like EMS works is it's kind of like a tiered system. So uh, the lowest licensure is an EMT. Um, there's one in the middle, which is an advanced EMT or an AEMT. Um, some states don't have that anymore, but it's kind of someone in the middle. And then I'm a paramedic, so I am one of the higher licensures. So basically, I can do everything that like an EMT and an advanced can do. I can do IVs, administer medications, um, intubate people, stuff like that. I have the highest level of um, life support training um, in like a normal EMS system. Um, And then uh, you can certify higher than that um, if you would like to, basically. Okay. So when someone's having the worst day of their life, they call you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Got it. Um, so can you kind of like tell us like usually on a day to day, like, you know, how many, um, I guess like patients, uh, do you see typically? Um, so right now, um, every, like every state or every jurisdiction can be, uh, set up differently. Um, I just moved from like the Midwest to the South within, um, a couple years. So, um, it's set up differently, but currently I work 24 hours on 48 hours off. I used to work 48 hours on 96 hours off. So mm. I work 24 hours straight. Um, sometimes I work 48, but so I show up to work. We, uh, live at our station. So we have bedrooms and stuff like that. So as soon as I clock in, um, I can have, I think last time I worked, I probably saw the 12 patients and it doesn't sound like a lot, but, um, my County, I work for a County instead of a private agency. So that is, um, uh, 11 to 12 ambulances running at the same time. And I'm stationed at one of them. So just for me, that was 12 patients that day. And when you think Um, about it, these are typically all emergencies, right? This is like rushed to the scene. Someone's life might be in danger. So uh, the way our county works is that every call is deemed an emergency until proven otherwise. So we do go lights and sirens to every call. And then we determine if we're going lights and sirens to the hospital. Um, So, yeah, all of them are considered to be emergencies. Obviously, we get the people who are like, my toe hurts. Yeah. And you get there and you're like, wow, (laughs) okay. Um, The next ambulance uh, zone over is having someone who actually has a real emergency. But, you know, um, some... You know, I don't think the public is super educated on what a true emergency is. They just know that they're having a really bad time. And the first thing that they know what to do is to call 911 because that's, you know, what everybody's told. So an emergency can range different to different people. But yes, most of them are like real emergencies. (laughs) What is the most common emergency that you usually show up to? Um, I say uh, we since I live in the South, a lot of the individuals are older. Um, it's a little bit different than living in the Midwest. Um, but like in the South, we have a lot of older individuals and those older individuals have true health issues. So a lot of, um, respiratory distress, you know, people with COPD or difficulty breathing, we get a lot of those. Cause if you can't breathe efficiently, it is very scary. You know, we come to people who are like 
super stressed out, red in the face. They're sweating because they're so scared because they can't, you know, take a breath properly. We do have people with a lot of heart issues. So, um, you know, the scares of chest pain and a heart attack, those are really common. And then uh, we live in a pretty, um, well, I work in a pretty busy area. So we get a lot of car accidents. Um, uh, most of the time they are very minor and we're just showing up, making sure everyone's okay. You know, people are like, my airbags went off, but, you know, I feel totally fine. We just check them out and send them on their way. Um, but I think those three are the most common ones. Okay. So you're only 24 years old. That's very young. Yeah. And you yeah. chose to write the subject line in the email, have seen enough tragedy to, I think you said last a hundred lifetimes. So what yeah. made you say that? Um, so I think it came up. Uh, cause I was listening to another one of your guys' episodes and I think it was the, the gentleman who either watched his brother die or had his brother pass away in a, in a really tragic car accident. And it just made me think where it's like, you know, I, I feel like at my age, you know, some people my age have never seen someone die before, but I've been doing this since I was 20. And I feel like that's a really, really young age to every time I go to work, there's, you know, a chance I can see one to five plus deceased individuals and it came to a point where I'm like this this doesn't feel normal like I'm 24 now I, I just turned 25 so like it's to the point where like that stuff doesn't phase me anymore um and it seems like you know that's not really a good thing you know what I mean um but yeah like every day like the last couple shifts I I'd say probably within the last two weeks I've seen at least one deceased individual um, or I had one in the past two weeks die right in front of me, which is, you know, not very pleasant, I would say, but it's never wavered, you know, to the point where I'm like, overwhelms me in such a, like a stress inducing way that I'm unable to do my job. That's never happened, but it still is like really weird because someone as young as me, some people haven't even seen anyone die before. Mm -hmm. I see it. Do you almost, do you almost feel like desensitized to it? Yeah, I, I definitely would say, and I feel like a lot of first responders would say that as well. I mean, you know, the deaths that we experience, you know, it goes from, you know, someone came home and noticed their family member was deceased and they call us and we, you know, legally pronounce them deceased and stuff like that mm -hmm. to, um, like I said, a couple weeks ago, I had the unfortunate experience of like someone like took their last breath literally right in front of me. And we had to go absolutely like, you know, get them on the stretcher, get them in the ambulance, start CPR, do all the things, intubate them and then bring them to the hospital um, to even like really, really tragic things where like something happened, like a car accident, for example, and you show up and there is nobody to save, you know, mm. it, it, it's like a spectrum, but I feel like in school they do, you know, kind of um, desensitize you right away where it's like, you have to think of this as a, we're telling you the best way to try to get this person back. Like technically when you're doing CPR, they are deceased. Um, mm -hmm. But um, they teach you, you know, if you start this cycle and you keep going, this is their best chance of survival. And there is a chance that you can get someone back. So it is kind of, desensitizing in a way where it's like, if you do what you're supposed to do, there's a chance that they could come back and they won't be deceased anymore. Um, but you know, we see this stuff all the time and it comes more like routine, which is kind of like, you know, the weird part. Yeah. Well, what's the mindset in the case that you just mentioned where you said someone took their last breath in front of you, or maybe it's someone that yeah. you're trying to save in the moment, but they don't make it because I'm sure you've, saved yeah. a lot of people and that's obviously yeah. the goal but there's simply just no way you can save everyone uh, so what is that yeah. mindset after something like that happens i mean in this specific situation um this individual wasn't in the best health and it was a situation where they don't care for themselves as they should they don't do what their doctor is supposed to tell them so this individual was young like a, i think they were like only a couple years older than my mom and i'm 25 so my mom's like 51, 52. I think this person was 55 and they already were in congestive heart failure. That's just where your, your, um, 
like your heart is not pumping effectively and it can cause like fluid buildup and it can cause arrhythmias and a whole bunch of stuff happening. But if you take medications, like you can live into your nineties with congestive heart failure. And this person had COPD as well, which is a pulmonary disease, uh, which causes you not to breathe effectively. And like I said, people, if you take care of yourself, you can live for a long time with something like that. And they were just a person that didn't take care of themselves. So um, they were in like respiratory distress, like struggling to breathe for like three hours. And a family member finally saw them. It was like, this is not OK. Called 911. And unfortunately, it was it was a little bit too late. Um, they were alive when we got there and they were just struggling so hard. So we we're like trying to put the oxygen on them and talk to the family member. Like, what kind of problems do they have? Like, how long do you think this has been going on for? Because that can change like our course of care. And then while I'm talking to the family member, which unfortunately they were young, they were like 17 years old, the family member who called, they uh, just stopped breathing. So then it went from trying to get as much oxygen to them as possible to, you know, cardiac arrest, CPR, you know, drilling holes in their bones to get um, like medications to them, um, you know, crushing and feeling bones breaking in their chest from the CPR, intubating them, you know, trying to get them back. And, um, I mean, for us, if you, um, start that cycle, if you notice something's going South, uh, and you get that cycle going and start the CPR, get the oxygen and get all that stuff moving, it just feels, it feels like a, um, like a routine almost, and you kind of push the, oh my God, this person's dying to the back of your head until it's over with. Um, and so you don't, uh, at least me, I don't think about it until I have time to think about it. Where it's like, you know, we drop them off to the hospital. The doctor tries the last couple of things that they can pull out of their rear end to try to save them. And if it doesn't work, you know, they call it at the hospital. And uh, then you're like, damn, there was like a 17 year old girl on scene and she watched her a family member basically passed away and we had to tell her, you know, just meet us at the hospital. We're going to do everything I can just meet us there. And then she gets to the hospital to find out that her family member is deceased. And we don't think about it until after that whole cycle is broken, you know, and then we're like, damn, that was really messed up. <laughs> and you know what I mean? Do you like, do you think that you, you said you've been doing this for like four or five years. Like, have you, been yeah. able to sort of leave work at work or does this kind of affect you? Like when you get home, I imagine, um, you know, dealing with death and everything is, is pretty taxing. Yeah. You, I really do try. And all of us have like this unwritten code. Cause we, we work really closely with our fire department, like the station that I'm at, it's actually stationed with a fire department. So there it's not just two of us on the ambulance and that's it. We basically live in a firehouse with like me, my partner, and then four other people, which is cool. Cause we're not taking that stuff home back to the station and loathing and like, you know, rolling in sorrow. You know what I mean? There's a whole group of people. And, um, we do have like an unwritten, like policy to like leave that shit at the firehouse and not bring it home with you. Uh, but sometimes, you know, there's like probably on every first responders list, there's like those top three calls where you like, you would never, ever, ever want to get and um, those kind of things you would probably end up taking with you. But for the most part, it's like, you know, you sit down with your partner, you're like, you know, was there anything else we could have done? No, I don't think so. I mean, the only thing we could have done in that situation is the person could have called a little bit earlier and maybe they would have gotten to the hospital in time, you know, and we can't think about stuff like that. It's like, but then after that, you're like, we did everything we could have done, you know, we brought it to the hospital. The doctor couldn't even do anything. And, you know, that's just what it is. And then it's like, go team, I guess. Uh, that's <laughs> yeah. just kind of what it feels like. Guys, before we finish this conversation, we do have a few cool sponsors and deals that we want to tell you about. There's not many things more important, I would say, than the air that we breathe every day, right? That seems pretty important. So what if I told you that Americans spend an average of 90% of their time indoors and we take about 20,000 breaths a day. It's a lot of breaths. It's a lot of air entering our lungs. But the indoor air that we breathe is two to five times more polluted than outdoor air. When I first heard that statistic, it blew my mind because I agree, we do spend 
most of our time indoors. And that's a terrible thought to think that if we're sitting in our homes, in our apartments, our schools, our jobs, wherever we may be, that the air is actually more polluted than if we were to go outside. And in some cases, that indoor air can be up to 100 times more polluted. That's crazy. And this is all according to the EPA. And did you know that air pollution is responsible for nearly 7 million premature deaths globally? That's crazy. So you're probably thinking, that's terrible news. What's the solution? That's where we get to introduce an air purifier that has captured the attention of a ton of media outlets. Honestly, it's been on CNN, Money, ABC, and more. And that air purifier is the Air Doctor. Air Doctor filters out 99.9% of dangerous contaminants so that your lungs don't have to do the work. The Air Doctor can do that work so that fresh, clean air is hitting you with all those breaths that you take each day. And these contaminants, they include pollutants like dander, uh, allergens, pollen, dust mites, uh, mold spores, that's a scary one, and even bacteria and viruses that can make you sick. So the Air Doctor is the filter that is stopping this from getting into your body, which is, again, what, what's more important than that? I can't think of that many things. And Air Doctor comes with a 30-day breathe easy money back guarantee. So, hey, you can try it. And if you don't love it, you just send it back for a refund, just minus the shipping. And you can head to airdoctorpro.com and you can use the promo code OPL. And on top of that money back guarantee, you're also going to receive up to $300 off of air purifiers. And this is exclusive to OPL listeners which is awesome. It's a deal that you should definitely jump on. And you'll also receive a free three-year warranty on any unit. And that's an additional $84 value. So they're giving a lot away here while protecting your lungs. So lock in this special offer by going to airdoctorpro.com. That is A-I-R-D-O-C-T-O-R-P-R-O.com and use promo code OPL. Again, that's up to $300 off an air purifier. So check that out. I know we don't share that much of our personal lives on this show. Uh, we keep it about the guests, but here's something that Joe could definitely attest to. I suck at drinking. I don't know if that's the best way to put it. I like to drink. We'll go out and drink, but typically the next day I am super off my game and I feel like I'm not even drinking that much. I'm just going out trying to socialize. You know, Joe invites me to these places and I'm just like, oh, like, the next day is just, it's going to be destroyed. So then I end up saying no a lot. And then I kind of regret that because I want to go out. I want to, I want to hang out with my buddy, Joe and other people. But recently uh, there's a solution to my issue and it could be a solution to yours as well. And that is Zbiotics Pre-Alcohol Probiotic. And it's the world's first genetically engineered probiotic. Uh, it was invented by PhD scientists to tackle rough mornings after drinking and the way it works is when you drink, alcohol gets converted into a toxic byproduct in the gut. And it's this byproduct, not dehydration, that's to blame for that rough next day. And Zbiotics produces an enzyme to break this byproduct down. So if you just remember to make Zbiotics your first drink of the night, and of course, drink responsibly, and uh, you'll feel your best tomorrow. When I found out about this and when they sponsored the show, I was like, yes, thank you. Please send it to me. Send it to me now. And uh, I've literally been using it ever since. And since I've been having Zbiotics and making that the first drink of my night when I go out, the day after has been so much better. It's been so much more productive. I'm not worried about having plans the next day, scheduling, you know, whatever, coming in here to record or gym sessions or meetings, things that I would try to actively avoid if I was going out and drinking the night before because of how terrible I, I would feel the next day. So this has been a game changer for me. And I think that it could also be a game changer for you. 
So you can head to zbiotics.com slash OPL to get 15% off your first order when you use OPL at checkout. Zbiotics is backed with 100% money back guarantee. So if you're unsatisfied for any reason, they'll refund your money, no questions asked, which is amazing and a very nice gesture. So remember to head to zbiotics.com slash OPL, use that code OPL at checkout for 15% off. And thank you, Zbiotics, for sponsoring this episode and uh, help fueling our good times. Yeah. I mean, I guess that helps process that. And it's just, you know, jobs like this, you know, your shift starts and you're just ready to take on trauma. That's just always mind blowing to me. You You kind of have to be prepared for everything. Right. You have to be like, okay, let's get ready to go because anything could happen. And to be able to function if that that does happen like you just said that list of three that you never want to get but if you get called to one of those horrific things that are on your list like you still have to perform the same there's no you know you can't stand there and be in shock or scream or yeah yeah what uh what is that list for you and have you ever experienced any Um, of them for my list um i kind of I mean, d- people are different in any way. I mean, every first responder has their list of icks and then the list of calls that like are absolutely no, like their list of icks. Some people are like, if someone throws out, throws up on me, I'm done for, you know, if someone <laughs> right, right. Is on me, I'm done for like, that's a different list. But like, uh, for mine, um, like if I ever had to deal with like a cardiac arrest on a child, I would be broken into a million pieces. And then, um, like a super, So another situation, obviously every firefighter would say like someone who like the smell of like burning flesh or whatever, um, is really bad. Uh, We had, um, a paramedic in our agency, they got a call to, um, someone who was dragged out of a burning house and they were entirely 100% burned, but unfortunately they were still alive. So they had to, you know, transport them a helicopter wouldn't fly it's kind of cool when we get to like launch a helo over the radio you kind of feel like a badass but in this case it wasn't cool because you know the helicopter wouldn't fly those those instances they would literally pick them up and fly them to the biggest hospital they could find in a 20 mile radius in this case they had to drive them down the road 35 miles to the closest trauma center where they were just pulled out of a burning building they're in so much pain like that was probably one where i'd be like I don't know how you did that. And then um, <clears throat> probably uh, I think my last one is those really, really bad like trauma incidents where like multiple car accidents, vehicles flipped over. And when they they teach us in school that in like I don't know if you ever heard of like a mass casualty incident or like a triage incident where you have to go around and count how many people they are and you have to assign them colors, basically. So like a green tag is considered like walking wounded, someone who just, you know, broke their wrist, but they're still, and they have scratches and bruises and they can still walk and they're totally fine. And then there's people who are considered yellow. Like maybe they need one little thing to make them okay. Like maybe a little bit of oxygen or something to make them okay. And then there's red, like the people who are in danger, they need us right now. The worst part is, is what it's called a black tag. And those are people that are like, beyond help like they could technically still be alive you're just like watching them bleed out and you're like okay there's nothing that i can do to save this individual i just have to leave them here and i have to go on to the next person and it's like really insane to think of that you know some people think it's super like cruel but the way my professor described it is situations like that it's like doing the most good for the most amount of people and if you see someone that you know, even if I throw every skill that I have at this individual, they could still die. That's, I've just wasted so many of my, like wasted sounds absolutely horrible, but like, I just wasted all those skills on someone where like, if I did the same thing to them, they would end up surviving. And that's just a situation where I, that would break me. I never even thought of that. Like that's such, for lack of a better term, just a psychological mind fuck where you almost have to operate as a machine, right? Just to know where you can do the most good. 
Yeah, that's literally what you have to do. Like, and sometimes only one ambulance shows up and you have to request more. So like me and my partner and my partner right now is a 21 year old girl who's like five feet tall, just this little angel. And I just picture all the time, like me and her showing up to something absolutely insane and me telling her, like, go and try to find somebody that we can save like right now. And then coming across someone that is like, no matter what we do, this person's going to die anyway. And we just have to walk away from them. Mm. And that's a situation where I'm like, I don't think, even though I know that that's what I have to do. I feel like if I was in that situation, I still wouldn't be able to forget myself. You know what I mean? Would you say that that's the hardest part of the job? Yeah. I, I would say that it's like, you know, there's for me, I try to put myself in that mindset of like, I did everything I could. I get all the skills that were given to me in school and through like my professors, my mentors and everything. Um, that there's just some times where it's like the body can only go through so much before it gives up. You know what I mean? And you have to understand that like with this individual, death was inevitable and there was nothing that I could do to save them. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's just sometimes you have to think of that. And that's the only thing that can get you to process what just happened. It's like, even if I would have tried a little harder and their body could have only withstand it so much. Mm -hmm. Wow. You know, you kind of just joked. It's like you and this 21 year old, but you guys are like absolute beasts and like heroes. Like it, you know, like you, it's yeah, you could almost laugh that. about that. Like this is who showed up, but it's like, yeah, with your training and yeah, what you're able like, to do, like, sure. Like, you know, we'll take anyone. Yeah. It's like, could you imagine like you falling and breaking your leg and you call 911 and a 25 year old and a little 20 year old, 21 year old girl shows up and you're like, what the hell are you guys going to do to save me? <laughs> I would trust you though. How I'm also such a baby. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's it's crazy. Um, yeah. So, what do you love most about the job, and what's most rewarding? I think um, the most rewarding thing is like uh, they well, my school that I went to because I did it university based instead of going through like a program where they kind of just like you pay them, you go through the school, and they like pop you out. I went to like a university, so I have two degrees, and um, so they really, really tried to make sure that we are able to describe the things that are going on in like layman's terms, like as stupid as possible. So these people can understand what's going on. Like when you see someone who is like, I've been going to all these doctor's offices. I still don't know what's going on with me. I still feel like shit. What the hell is going on? I just feel sick. Like this one woman the other day, she's like, I have a cardiologist appointment tomorrow. I don't know why I feel like shit. I was just trying to get my eyebrows done and I felt like I was going to pass out. So I left and she's like, I didn't want to drive my car because I was so dizzy. And we were able to like, okay, lady, calm down. Let's take a look at you. You know, we put the monitor on her, look at her heart and we'll be like, I found your problem. I know your nurses just said that there's something funny wrong with your heart and you have to go to the special doctor to get it figured out. But like, I was able to show her what was going on. And it's like these weird little things, the more often that they happen, you know, they can make you feel like basically dog shit. And until you get that fixed, like get a medication that'll make these go away or, you know, uh, whatever your cardiologist wants to do, you'll feel better. And that's why it's important that you go see this doctor because if you go to it, if I take you to an ER, they're going to be like, well, go see a cardiologist. They might make you feel better for tonight. Um, but this is an underlying problem that a specialist has to fix. And she was so grateful where she's like, all those nurses and all those doctors that I've been to were not able to explain what was wrong with me. They're, they just said, go see this specialist. And now I understand how important it is that I go see that one specific doctor. So I don't feel like this anymore. And that's kind of cool because it, I mean, EMS and fire, I know both of us, I can't speak for police officers. Like my husband, you know, went through the police academy and all of our friends are cops. Like I know nothing about what they do. They just show up and help me every once in a while, which is awesome. But like, I know for EMS and fire, we do a lot of education 
and stuff like that and making sure people understand the importance of why their doctor told them to do what they need to do um, so they don't feel like shit. And um, that lady was super grateful. And I've been able to do that quite often, you know, because I feel like doctors and nurses who work in a hospital and they throw around medical terms all day, they don't realize that these people have no fucking clue what you're talking about. Yeah, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Like you have to, like sometimes you have to take the extra five minutes out of your day to sit down and explain it to these people as dumb as humanly possible, because then it's my job to do it if they don't get it. Cause they're like on their living room floor. Cause they passed out because they're not taking their meds because you didn't explain to them how important it was and what was actually wrong with them in terms that they could understand. And that's pretty cool because we, we get people that are super grateful for stuff like that. And I, you know, I like that I get to be able to do that because then, you know, maybe if I didn't tell them that they could have just totally ignored their doctors and ended up, you know, in way worse shape. You know what I mean? I love going out to eat. This is one of my favorite things in the world. Uh, I can speak for Joe as well. He loves going out to restaurants. Outside of this show and the content and things that we do, that is probably our favorite activity is trying new restaurants. Luckily, you know, we're here in New York City, so there's an endless supply of amazing places to try. And uh, it's incredible, but it does leave you craving that top tier restaurant quality food because it's not something you could do all the time. Uh, Definitely gets expensive, that's for sure. But luckily, thanks to our friends at Cook Unity, there is a way to get that level of culinary satisfaction in your home for your own dinners at a very affordable price. So, you know, we're still going to be out there exploring our local food scene, but we can't do it all the time. So Cook Unity is the first chef to you service that delivers locally sourced meals from award-winning chefs right to your door every week. And it's cheaper than other delivery options. That's for sure. So full disclosure, uh, just the other day uh, when I signed up for Cook Unity, I was able to pick my order. So I have six meals coming. I think they're actually arriving today. I can't wait. And they arrive fresh, never frozen, which I'm looking forward to. But it was one of the easiest processes of just kind of going through that interface and picking your meals or putting in your dietary restrictions. Uh, I've done a lot of food services like this and I don't, this one just felt so simple. It felt so clear. The pictures were amazing. You just saw exactly what you were getting, the ingredients, the calories. And I want to read you some of the choices because I'm like, my mouth is watering thinking about this arriving. We've got rosemary flank steak. We've got pan seared chicken breast with shallot vinaigrette. We got coconut lime hanger steak, jerk chicken thighs. There's a couple more. I'll actually put the image of my order here so you guys can see. And it's really cool because it also shows the chef that has made each of these meals. So it's really unlike any other uh, food service that I've experienced. And it really, you really feel that you're getting this chef prepared, super high quality food, these really thought out meals um, sent to you. So I'm really looking forward to tasting it and I'll be checking back up uh, on how that was, but so far so good with Cook Unity. And if you guys want to experience chef quality meals every week delivered right to your door, just head to cookunity.com slash OPL and enter code OPL before checkout for 50% off your first week. That's a big discount. That's 50% off your first week by using code OPL or going to cookunity.com slash OPL. Um, try that out and uh, show me what you guys order if you end up doing this and you can compare it to mine and we'll see who has the best meals, but enjoy it. Yeah, exactly. Um, do you have any like, you know, calls that you kind of went on in the past that just sort of stick out to you or if there's one in specific and it doesn't have to be like the most horrible one. It could be like, you know, an amazing thing that happened, or maybe it is horrible. I don't know. But, uh, you know, just one that kind of specifically sticks out in your mind and always stays with you. Yeah. I mean, I, I did have this call. It was with a little kid. So like when you, when dispatch tells you that you're going to a call with like a a three-year-old child, you're like, Oh my God, please no. And you're like looking up, we have like apps and stuff like this to like generate the child's weight and stuff like that so that we know ahead of time you know what size the patient is and like if we need medications what the dose would be so I'm like pulling it up and I was like oh no please don't let anything be wrong with this child and then um 
I forget what their issue was, but we ended up transporting them. And by the time we got him out of the ambulance, like he was like holding on to me and he was clinging to me. It was so cute. He was adorable. And, um, his mom actually like contacted my agency and sent me like a cute little card and like thanking me. And that was so sweet. I love it when people do that. And we have, um, really good people in our community that will do stuff like that. Like people who survived to like a cardiac arrest or whatever, their family will reach out to us and be like, Hey, you know, obviously they were unconscious. Like they were, you know, deceased at the time they ended up surviving, but they want to thank you. And so our agency will put together like a whole meetup. Like we'll go to their house. The fire crew uh-huh. will show up and like the EMS crew will show up and it gives them a chance to thank us, which is wonderful i love stuff like that that's really nice yeah that's amazing that's how it should like there's no bigger celebration than like some stranger saved my life you know yeah it's it's always awesome like everyone cries everyone gets hugs they usually give us cards or something like that and it's it's so sweet and i love stuff like that that's really cool that's good to hear and that's obvious why that's rewarding to be able to, yeah. you know, give someone a chance to keep on living. Um, yeah. you know, obviously for you guys, you're still putting yourselves on the front line of potentially seeing horrible yeah. things and being part of, you know, trauma in people's worst days, but obviously the ones that you're able to help that you're able to save. Uh, I, I can't really think of something more incredible in life than saving mm-hmm. someone's life, you know? Wow. Is there anything that you want to leave people with? Um, You know, I know you don't speak for all paramedics or all first responders, but like any misconceptions about the job um, or anything that you just want to leave people who might find themselves on the other end, you know, the person who might, who you might be showing up because they had to call 911. Yeah. um, One thing that I really do wish that the public was more educated about because we run into this problem very, very often is um, like with older individuals who are obviously they're going to pass away anyway. But uh, we have a lot of people in our district that are very uneducated about the perks of like hospice care and end of life care. Like you would not believe how many times we see these old people who are just in crippling pain or so unhappy living out the rest of their days that they, um, that their family thinks that hospice care is basically like watching them die. And it's not, uh, hospice care and end of life care is making someone comfortable so they can live out the rest of their days, like in peace and pain free and, you know, stuff like that. Um, like you would not believe how many people's houses we go to, And these old individuals who could die like a month from now, they don't have a do not resuscitate order, which I don't know if you guys know what that is. It's like a it's like a form that you or like your medical power of attorney and your physician sign that says, if I were to pass away, please do not do CPR on me. Um, A lot of older individuals opt for something like that because they know that they're going to die and how brutal CPR is like you literally break people's sternums in half. Like it's insane Um, that you would not believe how many like children I would say don't want their parents to have a DNR order because they think that CPR saves everyone's life. It doesn't. Um, If they were going to die, they were going to die anyway. And sometimes CPR does not bring people back. So like the importance of like, do not resuscitate orders, hospice care, like, I would not forgive my siblings if they didn't want something like that. And we literally watched our parents like die in pain. I would literally never forgive them because it is from someone who works with people like this all the time, watching someone die so painfully and so uncomfortable is heartbreaking, but these families don't understand that they feel like that opting for stuff like that is you're giving up and letting your family die. That's not what it is. It's I. It's coming to the realization that they are going to pass away. They're old as hell. They are sick. You know, let's make sure that they pass away as comfortably as humanly possible. So not with their chest crushed in, not with a tube in their throat, not with, you know, in immense pain. And these hospice 
facilities. It doesn't necessarily have to be a facility, but these hospice nurses that come to your house, they give them pain meds, they make them comfortable. And then so they can live out the rest of their days in as peaceful as humanly possible. And I really wish that um, the public was more educated about something like that because, you know, the rest of my job, a true emergency, you know, if you feel like you're in danger, or you feel like you've been harmed or you're in pain, obviously call 911. But there's other parts of our job that I wish we could educate more people about. And that's definitely one of them because I really am sick of seeing these really old ladies and uh, men who are literally suffering because their family doesn't understand how important, you know, do not resuscitate orders and hospice end of life care is for people. Wow. We, I, we really appreciate that as like the last tidbit. I think that's like really good. Yeah. It's an interesting message. Yeah. Didn't expect that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I could speak from experience too. Like my, my grandmother, like all she wanted was to be out of the hospital and just like in a bed and like, just let me go yeah. type of thing and not, you know, trying to constant. And we also didn't want to constantly try and like, you know, keep yeah. her alive and do whatever. She was ready to, but like, that's a different yeah, story. Yeah, you can't even put yourself in the, like, in that yeah. mindset unless you're She's there. She's like, bro, just like, age. get me out of here and stop <laughs> feeding me fucking oatmeal and just let me sit in the bed and go. Jeez. Yeah, and it's like even more heartbreaking when like, like we take these patients, we put them in the back of the ambulance. So now they're alone with me because like my partner drives and I'm in the back of them. And they're just like, I've literally had this old woman all, the entire ride to the hospital. She's like, isn't there something in this truck that you can poke me with a needle so I never wake up again. <laughs> and like Jeez. that literally broke my heart. <laughs> and it's like, obviously it was super morbid. I was like, girl, what the hell? No. <laughs> yeah. But if you think about it, it was because no one is advocating for her for something like that. She's literally in so much pain. The bitch wants me to kill her. <laughs> yeah, like, exactly. I'm not doing that. But it's like her, her family needs to advocate for something like that. She can't ask a random 24 25 year old to kill her i'm yeah. not doing that every yeah. time she you gets know, out of the house alone she's begging someone to kill her somebody <laughs> yeah. kill me, the mailman comes yeah. she's like strangle me now. <laughs> like just fucking kill me i won't tell anybody and it's like girl <laughs> that's great i mean again thank you so much for coming on and, and uh you know telling us about this and, and leaving those little tidbits of of knowledge and things that people yeah. need to be more aware of so thank you so much for taking the time yeah. And thank you guys so much for having me. I love the show. It's super cool. Like a, a new kind of concept, especially like for people who grew up with my strange addictions, you know, <laughs> sometimes, this, sometimes this scratches the itch, you know what Someone I mean? Someone had to carry the torch, <laughs> you know, from TLC. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Well, good luck with everything. Stay safe out there and thank you for everything you. that you do. Thank you guys so much. It was a pleasure, honestly. All right. Have a good one. You as well. Bye. What a wild job, man. You got to be a straight, like, gangster to be able to do that, honestly. To show up on the scene if someone's the worst day of their life and you're like, I am in doctor mode and mm -hmm. I have to do everything I can to whatever. Like, you can't be phased by anything. Yeah. That's difficult, man. It is. I respect people who can operate at their highest potential in the, the highest, most chaotic yeah. environment. Most you know? stressful, like, environments, like... But it's cool to hear. It's almost selfish talking to people like that because, like, we would only ever end up <laughs> like the one in the ambulance right, with someone yeah. like her showing up. And it's just, it's cool, uh, you know, just how reassuring it is of you know their training and how seriously they take this and and being on the front line of you know potentially seeing some horrific shit, but willing to fight through that for the reward of helping someone, of saving someone. And like you said in the beginning, these are a lot of calls. You know, our the worst day of people's lives. Like mm -hmm. I, I've never had to call nine one one. Luckily, like people don't often have to do that. So when you do, it's there. Odds are, it's a pretty crazy situation, and these strangers are going to show up and hopefully save you. Yeah, and like you said, you just got to like trust trust the training, and uh, it's just kind of wild, man. I mean, for for, I mean, fire firemen, police officers, EMS. Uh, obviously military and shit like uh, people like that are just it's another level like to be able to do that kind of service completely selfless and putting yourself in situations that like make no mistake I, I think that no matter what like we're all human beings so if you work any of those jobs you've probably seen horrible things 
even if you're you have the strongest mind in the world, you're going to be affected by that. So the fact that you know they keep going out there and doing it and saving lives and protecting people or whatever is yeah. just and, like incredible. And being faced with those sort of you know almost like moral dilemmas in your mind that was really interesting. I ne- that never really crossed my mind of a situation so bad where you have to now pick and choose who you can save and yeah. kind of logistically plan out like it would actually be a waste of my time to try to help this person. So I'm going to spend, that is a insane, like as a human, yeah. that's a crazy situation. Like if to I be spend in. my time on this person, they're going to die, but this person's also going to die because I was working on this person. Mm-hmm. So you have to just walk over to like, that's, t- that's very difficult. And like that sort of thing. And like, it's the right thing to do. I, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, but you know, that's, that's a, still a very difficult thing to, to, actually be able to do like it's you yeah. would think like someone needs my help more i need to help them but mm-hmm. you know it's 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 insane man i i can't imagine that you know people are strong enough to fucking do that job it's incredible so we thank all of them for their service um but yeah for anyone out there would like to be a guest on our show hit us up our email is oplpodcast at gmail.com yeah follow us on instagram tiktok at opl podcast you can head over to patreon.com slash OPL show to support the show. And that is all for this week. Yep, see you guys next time.